Greetings again today in that name that's far above every name, our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. Good to see you here in the auditorium of the Northside Baptist Church today. We welcome every one of you. We're hoping that God will bless you and uplift you. And you can leave saying it's good to have been in the house of God. And you out in the radio listening audience, we most certainly appreciate you tuning in to the Northside Baptist Church Hour. That's coming to you live right from the auditorium of the Northside Baptist Church here in Athens, Georgia. And if you get on your phone and call a friend, have them to tune in, we'll try to be a blessing to them as well. You'll be doing them a favor, and us a favor, and I trust you do exactly that. Take your Bible today and turn to Acts chapter 2. I'm going to speak today on the charismatic movement and the so-called unknown tongue. Turn to Acts chapter 2, page 1149 in your Schofield Bible. Now remember, this is tape number 216, cassette tape number 216. We have more than 200 tape available. Our broadcast is heard Monday through Saturday at 12 o'clock noon from 11 to 12 on Sunday. You can get these tape for $3 each. And the gift is used to help to free our radio expense. And I hope you're right to me. We have to buy tapes and various other things, and mailing stamps and so forth, and pay radio time. And I hope that you'll remember this as we endeavor to get out the word of God and stand by this whole mission work. In Acts chapter 2, verse 1, when the day of Pentecost was fully come, they were all with one accord in one place. And suddenly there came a sound from heaven as of a rushing mighty wind, and it filled all the house where they were sitting. There appeared unto them cloven tongues like as a fire, and it set up on each of them. And they were all filled with the Holy Ghost, and began to speak with other tongues, as the Spirit gave them utterance. And there were dwellers in Jerusalem, Jews, devout men out of every nation under heaven. Now when this was noised abroad, the multitude came together, and were confounded, because every man heard them speak in his own language. And they were all amazed and marveled, saying one to another, Behold, are not all these which, which speak Galileans? And how hear we every man in our own tongue, wherein we were born? Parthenians, Medes, Elamites, dwellers in Mesopotamia, and in Judea, Cappadocia, and Pontus, and Asia, Phrygia, and Pamphylia, in Egypt, and in the part of Libya, about Cyrene, and strangers of Rome, Jews, and proselytes, Cretes, and Arabians, we do hear them speak in our own tongue, the wonderful works of God. And uh, they were all amazed and were in doubt, said one to another, what meaneth this? Others said, these men are full of new wine. Now, if you notice here, these men were speaking about the wonderful works of God, which, of course, is characterized in the book of Psalms. Evidently, they were giving their messages from the book of Psalms at this particular time. Now, today, I want you to follow me in the scriptures. If you don't have time to turn to the scriptures, I'll give you, take a pencil, jot them down, make a study of them when you get home. I'm speaking on the subject, the tongues and the charismatic movement. We have a very dangerous movement in the land today known as the charismatic movement. You have people leaving different denominations joining that movement, and most of those people in that movement brag about their gifts and about speaking in unknown tongues, and most of them are not saved. More than 90% of the people today that you find in the charismatic movement have never been born again. You have Catholics, you have Presbyterians, you have Lutherans, you have Episcopalians, you have Southern Baptists, Northern Baptists, and you have even a lot of cults in this movement today speaking in what they call the unknown tongue. They are not even saved. It's a binding of the tares. It's a moving of the building of the one world church it is called the ecumenical movement. They're saying we have an experience. We don't care what the word of God says. We have an experience. We want to tell you about our experience. We want to tell you what happened to us. We don't care what the Bible has to say about it. And then they dwell on their experience. And that's very, very dangerous. Beloved, you need to uh, dwell on the word of God. You need to take your belief and actions from the word of God. Now I want to give you some places where the tongues are mentioned in the Bible. They are mentioned in Acts chapter 2 and verse 4. I read that in your hearing. 
This happened on the day of Pentecost. There when the Holy Ghost came and Pentecost came once and for all. It'll never happen again. And there they spoke in other languages. The apostles got up and they preached the word of God. They were Galileans themselves. They came from uh, around Galilee in that area. And they stood and they spoke in the language of the people that were represented there from all nations. I read you a list of the people that came there. And they could not speak the Hebrew or Aramaic language or whatever they used. And, but these apostles spoke in their language and they understood what they were saying. They heard the word of God in their own language. That was the tongues they were talking about there. And God gave them power to do this and they did. This happened on the day of Pentecost. And then you find again in Acts chapter 10 and verse 44. You'll find that Simon Peter was called to Cornelius' house. And then he came to Cornelius' house in Acts chapter 10, verses 44 through 46. While Peter yet spake these words, the Holy Ghost fell on all them which heard the word. And they of the circumcision, that is the Jews, which believed were astonished, as come, came with them Peter, because that on the Gentiles also was poured out the gift of the Holy Ghost. For they heard them speak with tongues. Now here we find the Gentiles speaking with tongues in uh, Acts chapter 10. Here we have the gate open to the Gentiles. Simon Peter is using the other key. He used key number one on the day of Pentecost. Key number two here in, in Acts chapter 10. And they spake with other tongues. Now the Bible plainly tells you that the Jew seeks after a sign. And the Bible plainly tells you that the tongues are their signs to the Jews, the, the unbelieving Jew. That's what they were for. I'll give you the scripture as we move on. And then you find in Acts chapter 11 and verse 15, uh, Simon and Peter said, As I began to speak, the Holy Ghost fell on them as on us at the beginning. Now Simon and Peter did not say the Holy Ghost came upon us every day, every month, on different occasions. They spake in tongues every day, every month, every week, up until this time. This was many years later on, whenever these people spoke in other languages. And Simon Peter said it happened to them like it did on us in the beginning, back in the book of Acts, chapter 2. That lets you know there they didn't practice speaking in tongues every day, every week, every month, every year. He referred back to the time it happened to them, and that was for a reason. Now, they spoke in tongues here in Cornelius' house to prove to these unbelieving Jews that they had received the Holy Spirit and, of course, received Jesus Christ as their Savior. Now, in Acts chapter 19 and verse 6, you find another place where it's mentioned. And when Paul laid his hands upon them, the Holy Ghost came up the Spirit of God, and they spoke with tongues. Now here you find those three places in the book of Acts and they are the only three places. And then you find again in the book of 1 Corinthians as we point out later where they spoke in tongues. Now God is bringing together here in the book of Acts all the component parts of the believers to bring them and mold them into one body. Now God did that throughout the book of Acts. He brought the message to Judea, Samaria, the other parts of the earth, the Gentiles, and then they were saved and those that had been saved received the Spirit of God. And these unbelieving Jews did not believe and would not have believed that they were brought into the body unless they spoke in the other language. And that they did. And usually every time where the other language is used or the tongues used, you always have an apostle present. An apostle is present always. And you always have Jews present on the scene because this is a sign and a sign only to the Jews. Now tongues were given as a sign to the unbelieving Jew. The Bible said tongues is for the unbelieving Jew and not for believers. In 1 Corinthians chapter 1 verse 22, for the Jews require a sign and the Greeks seek after wisdom. That Jew said I must have the sign. They got the sign in the book of Acts. Now you must remember that God nailed it down. God was bringing together all the component parts of the church and believers, molding them into one church. They're in the book of Acts. Keep that in mind. In 1 Corinthians chapter 14, verses 21 and 22, the Bible says, In the law it is written, With men of other tongues and other lips will I speak unto this people. Notice the phrase, this people, talking about the Jews. I will speak unto this people, and yet for all that they will not hear me, saith the Lord. Wherefore tongues are for a sign. 
I'm reading 1 Corinthians chapter 14, verses 21 and 22. For the tongues are for a sign, not to them that believe, not to them that believe, but to them that believe not. Talking about the unbelieving Jew. That's what they were for. The tongues only for the unbelieving Jew. Not for believers by any means, he tells us. And then number three, tongues were for a judgment sign to Israel. I won't take time to read these verses. I want you to jot them down. I may read one or two of them. Deuteronomy chapter 28 verse 49. The Lord shall bring a nation against thee from afar, from the end of the earth, as swift as the eagle flies, a nation whose tongue thou shalt not understand. Some four times in the Bible, in Isaiah chapter 28 and verse 11, and by the way, Paul quoted that verse in 1 Corinthians 14, Isaiah chapter 33 and verse 19, Jeremiah chapter 5 and verse 5, you will find in the Old Testament where God spoke about other t tongues or languages that the people could not understand. Every Jew that existed in those days that's old enough to know right from wrong knew that sign that God gave of the stammering lips, language not understood. Every Jew knew that was a judgment sign. They knew that. A judgment sign. Therefore, when people began to speak in other languages, those Jews trembled in their boots. They knew that was a judgment sign for them. They did not believe unless they saw a sign. And that was a judgment sign. They were well acquainted with that judgment sign. In 1 Corinthians chapter 14, verse 21, you'll find there that Paul is quoting from Isaiah chapter 28, verse 11. He said, it is, is it, written, it is written with men of other tongues and other lips will I speak unto this people, this people, this people, the Jews, and yet for all that they will not hear me, saith the Lord. Here Paul is quoting from Isaiah chapter 28, verse 11, right here where he's trying to straighten out the tongues mess in the church at Corinth. They were all fouled up in error pertaining to the tongues. Now Israel was to be broken off. If you read Romans chapter 11, you'll find that that was the sign that Israel was to be broken off and the Gentiles grafted in and those Jews feared that. And when they heard that scripture about the stammering tongues, the other language, they trembled. And they knew all about that. And they knew that was a judgment sign. Therefore, they trembled in their boots. And then in 70 AD, whenever Titus came in and carried them out and destroyed the temple and, and destroyed the walls and scattered them abroad over the face of the earth, then, of course, that was the fulfillment of that judgment that God warned them about. Now, let me move on to another thought in, in the Bible and follow me closely. Tongues have ceased. Now, just keep your feet on the floor. Let me have your ears. Tongues have ceased. We do not have any more biblical tongues spoken by anyone today. Nowhere in the land. Beloved, when the Jews left the land 70 A.D., between 70 A.D. and 90 A.D., when they were scattered, there was no more need for tongues or other tongues. Beloved, they ceased like God said they would cease, and we do not have any today. Let me give you some scripture. In 1 Corinthians chapter 13 and verse 8, Charity never faileth, but whether there be prophecies, they shall fail. Whether there be tongues, they shall cease. Whether there be knowledge, it shall vanish away. In studying the scripture, you need to study chapters 11, or chapters 12, brother, and 13 and 14 together. Now he tells us something that's going to cease here. And he says, first of all, prophecy and knowledge is in the, the transit mood. It will continue till something stops it. It's in the passive voice. And so he tells us here, prophecy and knowledge will continue on until something stops that. Now what was to stop that was the completion of the Word of God and the completion of the body of Christ. And then that would stop. But he tells us tongues down here in the in-transit mood, that is uh, whether we see, he said they would cease, is in the in-transit mood, uh, they're in the middle voice, and that means that they just cease. They just stop and that's it. They just stop suddenly. And they stopped, they ceased when the Jews were driven from the land. There was no more need for an unknown or another tongue or language in that respect. Now you have no Bible tongues being spoken today. Now what is, uh, is taking place in the land today is a psychological aberration. You have a trained technique. You have people that's been trained and moved in the realm of psychology 
and human efforts by leaders teaching people, leading them into speaking some kind of monkey jabbering that's not according to the Bible because tongues have ceased. There have been no more tongues since Israel left the land. You may say now, Preacher Edwards, how about all of this charismatic stuff carried on today and these people out here there's a monkey jabbing and, and saying they're speaking in other tongues, unknown tongues. That's all uh, a, a trained technique. That's all mimicked and picked up by someone else. That is something that people get worked up into frenzy and they begin to work their jaws and say words and phrase over and over until they get their tongues all tangled up and then they begin to say something nobody understands. God is not in a million miles of that stuff and you better believe it. Tongues have ceased. No tongues today. And I want you to realize that. Now let me give you something here. I received last week a clipping from some dear people over in Harwell. And there's a big article in the Independent about the tongues movement over there in Anderson. And I'm just going to give you a paragraph or two of what is written about it and show you how unscriptural this may be. Now I'm going to read um, part of another paragraph, a part of the first paragraph, and I, I quote, Mrs. Brown also described her first experience in being slain in the spirit. Slain in the spirit. Being knocked out on the floor. And a lot of those poor people, they fall out in the floor. Their dresses come up to their hips and there they lay there in a decent manner. Now said at prayer service one night, we were all at the front of the church and the pastor asked us to pray for our loved ones who had died. How ignorant can a pastor be? Now, you can, you know the, the Pope and others will do that, but how ignorant can this man be supposed to be a man that knows something in the Bible? So he asked them to pray for their loved ones who had died. She said, now this is the, the woman, all of a sudden a feeling shot through my body, almost like electricity, and knocked me to my knees. And then when I was, it was like I didn't have any control over what I was doing. I got up and started dancing around the church. I knew what I was doing, but it was almost like I was in a trance. I had given control over the spirit. Late after I stopped, people came to me crying and hugging me. I administered to them this thought. I edified the people. They said, when I was dancing, it looked like my feet weren't even touching the ground. Now, do you think God had anything to do with that? Absolutely. That's absolutely ridiculous. When the pastor said, pray for the, your loved one that's dead, then the spirit hit her and she hit the ground. She gets up dancing, and man, the people is carried away. That's not of God. That's of the flesh altogether. All tongues may not be of the flesh. Some of it's of the devil. Now, spiritism and uh, uh, some of the other movements in, in the land, witchcraft and all of that, they all speak in tongues in these movements, spiritism and witchcraft, and that's of the devil. Now, the tongue movement you have today, 99% of it is of the flesh. Now, this woman here doing a dancing around there and acting a fool, and, and then all the people thought that was God and blamed that on the Holy Ghost. God wasn't 10,000 miles there. And if the pastor didn't have any more knowledge of the Bible than to ask them to pray for their loved ones who had died and gone on, then he needs to get out of the pulpit and study the Bible. Beloved, that's dead wrong. Let me read another portion here. We find a person here is called... Nancy Prado, she grew up and so forth in the Baptist church, says, and I quote, Last October, she visited Freedom Life Fellowship. During the worship service, she found herself filled with the Spirit, lying flat on her back on the floor and speaking in a foreign tongue. Now, here's a woman who's been slain, knocked out in the floor, and many times their dress comes up to their hips. There they're lying down the floor. Now, notice what happened. Really, it was the last thing I expected, even though I truly wanted it, she said. But to me, in a strange church, all dressed up with all these people you don't know, and find yourself lying on the floor is really strange. But as I was lying there, it was almost like I was in a peaceful sleep. When I got up, I was so happy and filled with joy that I laughed all the way home. I guess the devil did too. Now, do you think God is in that? Not in a million miles. A woman walking in and throwing her heels up in there and falling flat on her back, lying down on the floor like somebody had knocked her out and blame that on being slain by the Spirit. Now, you better be aware of this modern charismatic movement and tongue movement today. It's confusing a lot of people. It's breaking up a lot of churches. 
And it's not of God. God has nothing to do with it. It's the building of the one world church. It's ecumenical movement. And it's absolutely not of the Holy Ghost of God. Now we find that Paul gives the order here for tongues in the church at Corinth. Down there in Corinth is one of the most carnal, one of the most worldly, one of the most sinful churches that you find in that day. Now they were carnal. They were not real Christians. They were saved, but they were carnal. You can't be carnal and Christian at the same time because the word Christian means Christ-like. You can't be Christ-like and be carnal at the same time. They were saved carnal church members. And they had got in an argument and fuss down there about different things. Divided over preachers, going to court one with another, and many, many other things they did that was wrong in that church. And then they got hung up on the tongues. Now the charismatic movement today, the tongues outfit today, they are hung up on the tongues like the people got hung up on the tongues in the, in the church at Corinth. And that church is the most worldly, unspiritual church that you would find anywhere. They had gifts but no spirituality. And there they got hung up on the tongues matter. And Paul wanted to straighten them out. And Paul said to them, he said, Now you're like a group of children. In 1 Corinthians chapter 13 verse 11, When I was a child, I spake as a child, I understood as a child, I thought as a child. But when I became a man, I put away childish things. Now Paul said, You people that car to young converts, you're acting like a gang of young'uns over there claiming you speaking in tongues and you have all these different gifts and miracles and so forth you can perform. And he said, you're acting like young'uns. In 1 Corinthians chapter 14, verse 20, he said, Brethren, be not children of understanding. How being in matters, be ye children, but understanding be ye men. He said, if you go and act like a bunch of kids, act that way in malice. That is, if you get mad with one another, get in good humor right quick. That's the way children do. But he said, if you're men... If you're adults, if you know enough God, then act like men, act like women, and not like a bunch of youngins or barbarians. Paul said you over there trying to speak in other languages, said you sound like a bunch of barbarians. He said uh, uh, nobody knows what you're talking about, and he said uh, you are a barbarian in that sense. He tells us so in the Bible. Let me give you another verse of Scripture. He said in 1 Corinthians, If any man speak in an unknown tongue, a, a tongue... It says, let it be by two, or at the most by three, and that by course, and let one interpret. But if there be no interpret, let him keep silent in the church. Now, Paul said, if you're hung up on the tongues, the least gift, the least gift, the less needed gift, if you're hung up on that, then he said, now you must do it in order. You go all confused. People come in and you act like a bunch of barbarians, and they don't know what you're saying, don't know what you're talking about. He said, now, if you've got to be in a tongue speaking in the church, he said, now, he said, you do it, let two or three men, not women, two or three men do the speaking. Let them speak one at a time. And when he speaks, let an interpreter tell you what he said. And he then let the other speak and let him do otherwise the other. He said, now, if you don't have an interpreter, then keep your mouth shut. You got no business getting up in the church trying to blabber out something. You don't know what you're saying and nobody else knows what you're saying. He said, if you have an interpreter, you men, not you women, you men speak one man at a time. Now, the reason Paul told him to do that, tongues had not ceased at that time. This is before 70 AD. And they were still scriptural, but it was one of the least of all gifts. Now, Paul said, that's the way it's to be done. He said, now, if you don't have the interpreter, then don't do it. Some time ago, seven years ago, my wife and I pulled up in front of a tent in Athens, and we saw a little meeting going on, and we saw a man get up and, and did a lot of this here uh, mimicking and uh, monkey jabbing, ecstatic speech, and all that stuff that they, they make up and plan today. And he was really carrying on. And then when he sat down, another man got up, and he interpreted what the man said. He said he did. And I saw the man later, and I asked him, I said, well, how in the world do you interpret what happened? He said, well, the first thing that comes to my mind after I'm asked to interpret, that's what the man said. That's as unscriptural as it can be. God is not in that. Later, I found out the interpreter was a known homosexual and had been laying up with a man that was, was, was speaking in the unknown tongue. 
You see, God's not in that. God has nothing to do with that. And today, most of the people that are speaking in what they call unknown tongue and dancing around in the charismatic movement, most of them are not saved. They're not in a million miles of God. They're depending upon their flesh, upon experience, and not upon the Word of God. I don't care about your experience. I wouldn't give a dime for your experience if it's not based on the Word of God. If you can't base it on this book, I care nothing for it. Don't want to hear anything about it. And so we find in Paul said that's the way to do it. Now he said in 1 Corinthians chapter 14, verses 11 and 12, Therefore, if I know not the meaning of the voice, I should be unto him that speak barbarians. Paul said, nobody knows what you're saying. They're like barbarians, and he that speaketh uh, shall, uh, like barbarians, even so ye. So he called them a bunch of barbarians. And that was a bunch of heathen lost people in that day. Now speaking in tongues is not the sign of the baptism of the Holy Ghost. Now the charismatics, those are hung up on what they call the unknown tongue. The Bible doesn't say anything about an unknown tongue in the original. It's just tongues, a language, all, all language, same Greek word. It's used for everyone, every place I've given you from, from Acts 2 right on through the same Greek word. And the word unknown, if you notice it in the italics, and there the translators put it in there to try to explain something. And it's tongues, not an unknown tongue. There's no such thing as an unknown tongue. Beloved, God knows everything that's said and, and no such thing as an unknown tongue. Now, the Bible says here then that uh, the, the, the baptism of the Holy Ghost, they speaking in what you call other tongues. Today is not a sign of receiving the baptism of the Holy Ghost. Now, the Holy Ghost baptized people on the day of Pentecost into one body and component parts are brought in to move that church together. And when God completed that and the Jews were scattered and the tongues ceased, then God said there's only one baptism. There's only one baptism for the church age from that time until now. And that baptism is when you're baptized into the body of Christ. The Bible says in 1 Corinthians chapter 2 and verse 13, By one spirit are you baptized in the body of Christ. Will you be Jews or Gentiles? Will you be born or free? All made to drink into one spirit. Now, beloved, every saved individual has been baptized with the Holy Ghost. And if you go out here seeking the baptism, you're moving contrary to the Bible. You're doing something that's wrong. You're not to go out here and seek a baptism for the purpose of speaking in tongues. It just doesn't come that way. Now, you can go out and work yourself into a frenzy and work your mouth to, to, in, in such a state until you can't understand what you're saying, and you can call that baptism and tongues if you want to, but it's of the flesh. God has nothing to do with it. Some time ago, this supposedly a Baptist preacher, his wife had a church in Danielsville. I don't know what he's doing now. He ought to be out with that charismatic crowd in the uh, holiness movement somewhere, but I don't know what he's doing. And they were going to, uh, they got hooked on this charismatic movement and tongues movement, and his wife would go over there and on Friday afternoons, I believe that was the day, and teach the ladies in that church how to speak in an unknown tongue. How ridiculous. Beloved, if we had such thing as a tongue today, you wouldn't have to be taught how to speak in it. That shows you it's not real, it's not genuine, and it's not of God. And going about teaching women how to speak in an unknown tongue. That's fleshly. That's not of God. That's anti-Bible, if you please. Sometimes ago I heard a, a national nice evangelist. Man, he is up wailing away. And all of a sudden he started that monkey jabbing stuff. And that was just as unscriptural as anything that you ever heard in your life. Even if tongues had been in order, that would have been unscriptural. Why get up there and monkey jabber, monkey jabber? Nobody know what he's talking about. The Bible said, if you don't have an interpreter, shut your mouth. He ought to keep his mouth shut. Went ahead and played his piano or do something he could do because he's dead wrong on the matter of tongues. Tongues have ceased. I don't care who preaches they're not or how often they try to do it. They have ceased. you got no scripture to stand on. They have passed away. Now you receive the baptism of the Holy Ghost the moment you're born again. Now there's many feelings. Now you can be filled with the Holy Spirit over and over again. Oh, you say, preacher, what will I do when I'm filled with the Spirit? You'll act decent. You'll act like a Christian. You'll do that which is right. You won't speak in a, some kind of a jabba-jabba, unknown tongue. 
if you're filled with the Spirit. You're baptized in it with the Spirit the moment you say, you don't speak in tongues. Then you've got a cult down here, not too far away, that claims you have to be baptized in water, speak in tongues before you say, but that's a cult. That's not of God. That's anti Bible, not based on the Word of God. Now, the charismatics and tongue movement today is not of God. It could be of Satan in the field of spiritism and witchcraft. It is of the flesh. It is an ecstatic speech. It's babbling. It's a trained technique. Now, you must remember that. They train themselves to do that. They pattern after others. If somebody tries to speak, memorize or something to say, what do you call an unknown tongue? And then somebody just going to try to mimic that and try to do the same thing. That's the way it works. Uh, beloved, it just, it's absolutely not of God. And the Bible said everything to be done in decent and in order. In 1 Corinthians chapter 14, verse 4, let everything be done in decent and in order. Some woman comes down, falls flat on the floor, and throws her heels up in the air, and they have to run down and cover up her body. Do you think that's decent? Absolutely not. God said, let things in the church be done in decent and in order. That's not of God. That's the flesh. Don't you be carried away with this charismatic movement. Don't you be carried away with this untongue, unknown tongue movement. Because it's not of God. It's the building of the one world church. It's the ecumenical movement. And it'll be turned over to the Antichrist when Jesus comes at the rapture. And a lot of good people being caught in that thing. And then the apostle Paul said, you women, there when he's talking about these tongues, in, Acts, in 1 Corinthians chapter 14, he said, you women, if you're going to no want to know anything, you don't need to be trying to speak in tongues at the church. You ask your husband at home. If they get a revelation from God, if they have a message and in another language and have an interpreter, they'll handle that. You women, keep your mouth shut and keep silent and, and ask your husband at home. So most of the people today that are really boasting and pushing and advertising the so-called unknown tongue and the charismatic movement, you'll find them to be the women. And they're the very ones that God said that shouldn't do it. God said, women, don't speak in an unknown tongue in the church. You're out of place. That's back in the day when it was uh, permissible. And so since it ceased, since we don't have any tongues, and been none since about 90 uh, A.D., then uh, these women, they try to work up some tongues, and they take the lead like these women I read about Manderson. These women, see, they're women, and that's why they're so far from Scripture in what they're doing. They're completely out of place. Now, we thank God for our good women. We thank God for what they do. They have a place in the ministry. And uh, God Almighty has a place for them. And they should serve the Lord. But for a woman to try to speak in an unknown tongue, a man either. The outer order is not in God. It's of the flesh and could be of Satan. And you must remember that. And mark it down, the very ones God said to shut up, keep your mouth shut when it comes to the matter of tongues, ask your husband at home, they're the women, and they're the ones taking the lead in it. And you better beware. Most all cults started in the land, they've been started by some woman. Thank God for precious good women that love God, that work with their church, work with their husband, they're invaluable, and they have a place in the ministry as much so as a man, but they need to know where that place is and stay in that place. So the unknown tongue, the charismatic movement, is absolutely unscriptural. Unscriptural. Beloved, I'll take this book, and if you want to argue about it, I'll take this book and choke you half to death on the Word of God. I know what I'm talking about, and I know what this book teaches, and I know what this movement is doing, and you better not get entangled up with it. And if it ever starts in church, why well, you remember you, defeat, you can't get them out. You get out yourself. It's not a guy. I'll tell your church all the pieces. Church has been torn to shreds over this country because of that charismatic movement. It's all around Athens. It's sweeping over the country. Uh, Catholics, Presbyterians, Methodists, all kind of infidels, uh, unbelievers, people don't believe in the deity of Christ. All of them speaking in unknown tongues. You think God's got anything to do with it? If you do, then you, you, you don't have much sense. I thank you, God. And I'm sure you got enough sense. No, God's not in that mess. So you stay clear of it as God leads you, as you sojourn for God, and stay clear of it. It's not, I don't care how good they are. I don't care how sweet they are. I don't care how kind they may be, how holy they may act. They may have a, a ball of hair on their head like a rooster's comb. They may have dresses down the ankles. They may have long sleeves and black stockings. 
They may be a, a paintless, pouted faced saints and think they superior to everybody else, got something nobody else has got, but you cross them one time and they'll scratch your eyes out. They have no control of their temper. And they know nothing about what they're doing. They fill with pride. They think they're doing uh, God's work and think they got something nobody else has got. And they are totally deceived and they strut around, think they're more spiritual than anybody else. Brother, I'll tell you right now, you better be aware of that crowd. And so you sojourn for God according to the Bible.